Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with Reason Magazine senior editor Radley Balka. We are uh, looking at the three most egregious police abuse videos that have come to light in 2011. The first one we're looking at is a Utah SWAT team that goes in and tell us what they do. Well, they were actually investigating this guy's roommate, uh, and they uh, they pulled uh, him over, realized he wasn't at the house, uh, but then thought there was going to be a meth supply at the house, so they went ahead and raided the house anyway. Um, this this uh, gentleman was uh, in the house. He uh, was an admitted meth addict. And uh, this guy, you know, comes out, uh, thinks somebody's breaking into his home. Apparently, comes out with a golf club, and they open fire. It's a it's a pretty disturbing and, and shoot, gruesome video. And uh, did they kill him? Yeah. They yeah. Him. Uh, okay. Next up is uh, the Seattle Police Department, and the action happens off camera. What are we listening to the policeman in the car who's capturing the video? Uh, what's he talking about? So he, he sees this homeless guy, uh, has a knife that was perfectly legal under Seattle law. He, this was how he made some money. He carved things out of wood and sold them uh, on the street. And uh, the cop says, tells him to, to drop uh, the gun. And I think about six seconds expire from uh, the time he gets out of the car and confronts the guy until he, he fires the shots. Put the knife down. You also hear a, a woman say, you know, why did you shoot him? He wasn't doing anything. Ma'am, he had a knife and he wouldn't drop it. It's stunning, really, in how quickly uh, things escalate from this whittler sort of walking down the sidewalk, kind of minding his, business, minding his own business until he's, you know, dead on right. the sidewalk. Uh, and in this case, the cop was uh, was cleared. Uh, there was a, a, an investigation, uh, but there definitely won't be any criminal charges against him. Uh, and then the final one we're looking at, uh, this is uh, some cops in Michigan who go into a recording studio of a local heavy metal musician who was taping or uh, recording with his band and tell us what happens there. So they, they get an anonymous tip that this, there are drugs in this house and they find you know personal use marijuana. Uh, but one, once they're inside, they realize there's all this great, great equipment there. Uh, and first they actually start singing. <laughs> And the band was recording something. What we're listening to is tape that the police uh, right. didn't realize that they were making. You hear them start talking about uh, what of this guy's stuff uh, that they want to take through asset forfeiture. Hey, uh, what do you want to take in the basement? You want to take the drums and all that? Is there a way that we can quantify police abuse uh, of this sort? I mean, uh, some of it is violent, uh, you know, certainly in two of these three cases, I mean, we're talking about people being killed. Uh, is this type of uh, police action on the rise? Well, it's a tough question. I mean, I think in terms of, uh, we can certainly say that, for example, the use of SWAT teams has increased dramatically. Uh, we can look at asset forfeiture funds and, and how they've risen over the years. So that certainly is true. In terms of uh, sort of non-legal or illegal abuse, I guess, I mean, that's harder to quantify just because, you know, it's hard to say what, what does and does, doesn't um, constitute abuse, right? So. Uh, you get a cop gets captured on video beating somebody up, or the Seattle cop, for example, this homeless guy shooting. I mean, officially, that probably would not count as an incident right. of police abuse because he was cleared, right? So it's hard to tell. Police departments are pretty reluctant to track their own mistakes, uh, like a lot of government agencies. Yeah. Um, but you know, if you look, if you talk to criminologists, actually, uh, they will say academic criminologists will actually say that it's it's getting better that actually police uh, departments are. Uh, more professional and they are more accountable and transparent than they've been in the past. So that, that doesn't mean it's acceptable. Right. Uh, it just means that it's better than it was in the 50s and 60s. And how has technology changed things, both in terms of kind of citizen-based technology, say going back to the Rodney King beating, which we only saw because a guy was experimenting with his new video camera, uh, but up through an age where we have cell phones, things like that, but also where the police are actually surveilling themselves more. Um, how, how is that bringing things to light and is it helping? Yes, I mean, I think it's, it's great on, on all accounts. I think it's great that police are, are monitoring themselves with cameras and microphones and I think it's great that citizens can also have their own cameras to keep police accountable. Now, I think it does give rise to this perception that things are getting worse because we're now being more aware of police abuse. And I think traditionally, uh, you know, the police narrative was of what happened was the official narrative, and that's the narrative the prosecutors defer to, it's what the judges defer to, it's usually what juries believe. And now, I mean, there is this new very powerful weapon that citizens have uh, to, to challenge that narrative. Uh, and, you know, sometimes video can be misleading, it can be taken out of context, but it is a, a very, very powerful, potent weapon. And it's, I mean, there are 
dozens and dozens of cases where a citizen shot video has actually shown that a, a police officer lied on a police report. So I think you know it's holding police accountable, police officers accountable in those particular cases. Uh, but I also think it's it's encouraging sort of best practices in general because police now sort of go about their business knowing that everybody has a camera in their pocket. And I think that's a, a powerful incentive. Radley Balco, Senior Editor of Reason, thanks for talking to us. I'm Nick Gillespie for Reason TV.